weapon systems offline. Welcome pilots, my name is Hybrid V and today we're going to be talking about multifunction displays for our ships in Star Citizen. If you've ever played a flight sim, or indeed any other space sim, the idea of multifunction displays, or MFDs, should be a relatively simple concept to grasp. In short, MFDs provide us with detailed stats and data about our ship's weapons and components, as well as allow us to switch to certain defensive and offensive protocols on the fly, allowing us to tailor the ship's performance to our needs. A good pilot will know how and when to use their MFDs to maximize the effectiveness of their craft in all situations. So let's dive in and take a look at how we can use this to our advantage. Note that what I'm showing you here will translate to all ships in-game, even the alien ships, as the current MFD model is unified across all ships. Alright, so we're here with my Gladiator Bomber and the MFD panels below. First we need to know how to interact with our panels. The most obvious method is by holding down the interaction key, which is F by default. We can then move our cursor around and select different portions of our displays. Now, this method works well enough, but can be difficult to precisely interact with the displays, especially during combat. And you all know me, I love showing alternate methods. So instead, what we're going to do is hold our interaction key, F, and while holding the interaction key, we tap the W, A, S, and D keys to shift our view focus to a specific MFD. You also can use your mouse wheel to zoom in and out if you need to get a better look at your displays. On the top left of every MFD, we have the menu option. This will give us a list of pages we can display on the current MFD that we are looking at. We have everything from power to shields to targeting systems and even weapon management, among other things. For now, let's have a look at the power page. The power page displays our current power output usage, the required output needed, power priority triangle, and an emissions readout. There's also an additional sub-menu and a power button that allows us to power on and off the ship at will. Alternatively, we can hit the U key to turn off the power plant on and off at any time. Next to the power button is a stealth toggle, but we'll come back to that in a moment. On our power output usage bar, we have the power throttle. This allows us to set the maximum power output our power plant can generate to all subsystems. This is useful if you want to limit the power output of your power plant in order to keep your emissions low. In fact, right here you can see that we have a stealth notch indicator. This is the minimum power output that allows us to maintain operational effectiveness while keeping our signature to a minimum. Clicking the stealth button on the top right will auto set our power throttle to this preset. Along the usage bar, you may also notice power deficiency warnings listed here. These red markers show the amount of power required, minus the current power generated, and only shows when the power plant is not able to supply enough required power. This leads us to our Power Priority Triangle, or PPT. Most pilots incorrectly believe that the PPT increases damage or makes the ship faster. This is incorrect. All the PPT does is prioritize which subsystem we would like to receive power over everything else. You see, power is finite on our ships, and the pool of power available to us and the speed at which it generates power is entirely limited to the power plant we have on our ship. Civilian models, for example, will generate power at slower rates or have a lower pool of power compared to that of high-grade industrial or military-class power plants. What this means is that depending on the current situation, our power plant may not have the juice it needs to power all available subsystems. For example, if our shields take a big hit, 
The power draw needed to regenerate the shields could sap power from our thrusters and weapons, making them operate at a much less effective rate. When this happens, we have our PPT to prioritize which systems receive power in an emergency. We simply take our cursor over the center marker and drag it to each system. Currently in game, we have three systems we can prioritize, shields, weapons, and thrusters. We can drag our cursor to select maximum priority or just a little depending on what we need. Alternatively, we can adjust the PPT by using F5 to move priority to thrusters, F6 for shields, F7 for weapons, and F8 to reset the PPT to default. An example of where the power priority triangle can be useful would be if we were, say, running from multiple enemies. I could prioritize my engines to receive available power so that my engines are always running with as much power as possible, while my other systems, such as weapons and shields, receive less. Those other systems may fail or shut down if my power plant is stressed due to incoming fire, but at least I know my engines are going to be rock solid and get me back to safety because I prioritize them as being the first in line to receiving power. 90% of the time we'll be keeping our PPT to the center and we'll only really need to mess with it if we experience power issues during flight or combat. Above our power throttle we have two tabs, our systems tab, which is what we're looking at now, and an items tab. In the items tab it shows us a list of components and weapons that are currently are hooked up to the power grid of our ship. This shows the status of everything from our coolers to our weapons and even thrusters. On this page we have the name of each component subsystem. We can reorganize items on the list with the arrow buttons and reset the list back to default by clicking the priority reset button on the top right. To the right of the priority arrows we have the power on and off button that allows us to switch on and off individual systems at will. And to the right of that we have the overclock button, more on this in a minute. On the right of each listed component we have a bar showing its current power usage. For the power plant this will instead show the power output, just like the main tab with its power usage output meter. Further to the right we have the output throttle bar that we can adjust to limit the maximum usage of each component. Again, this is more for stealth purposes than anything else, so you may find limited usage for this. The power throttle is defaulted to the maximum power output. Some circumstances, including overclocking, can push the output above the maximum. This can cause issues with heat buildup and wear. Whenever the output exceeds the max, it will show in red on the display bar. Above the output bar on the top right is the health of the component. Damaged components can cause issues with performance. If you're noticing anomalies with your current flight profile or your weapons are not firing as fast as they normally should, then chances are something is damaged and you can quickly glance here to see which components may have damage to them. Lastly, let's return to the overclock button we talked about earlier. Overclocking allows us to overcharge the system in question, improving performance at the cost of increased power usage, heat generation, and possible component degradation. Overclocking is handy in a pinch when you need to get a little bit more out of your systems. For example, we can overclock the shield generator to improve shield regeneration rates. The downside is that the shield generator can overheat and subsequently shut down, causing the shield faces to collapse. We can also overclock weapons to improve their fire rate at the cost of increased heat buildup and damage to weapons. Experiment with overclocking, but use it sparingly. If used incorrectly, you can potentially cause catastrophic failures that are difficult to recover from, such as overclocking your power plant for too long and causing it to burn out and permanently disabling your craft. Next, we're going to look at the Shield Systems page. On this page, we have the power button, standby switch, shield generator power indicator, as well as the throttle and shield generator status indicators. The power button is a toggle for the shield generator. This allows us to turn off and on the shield generator at will. Alternatively, we can toggle the shields at any time with the O key. The standby switch is a bit more interesting here. What it does is it stops the shield regeneration process. So if the shield takes a hit, it will not regenerate the lost health while the standby switch is engaged. This is useful if you're suffering from power loss due to shield charging, or if you're trying to be stealthy, as any shield regeneration will cause electromagnetic emission spikes, making it easier for your opponents to see you on radar, as well as scans. The shield generator throttle works exactly like the power throttle that we looked at earlier for the power submenu. This simply allows us to control the maximum power output of our shields and is maxed out by default. 
as well as it shows the current power draw and if there's any power deficiencies that could be affecting the shield currently. The shield status indicator displays the strength of each shield facing in a percentage value. The damage absorbed by the shield facing will drain the more it continues to deflect incoming fire until the shield facing collapses. We can move the health pool of our shield facings by using the numeric keypads on our keyboard. This allows us to boost a shield facing's health pool above 100%, at the expense of the health of other shield facings, of course. Numpad 8 moves the shields forward. Numpad 4 moves the shields to the left. Numpad 6 moves the shields to the right. Numpad 2 moves the shields to the rear. And Numpad 5 rebalances all the shield values to default. Holding a numpad key down shifts more of that shield to that section. This can be useful if you want to boost the health of a specific shield face. For example, if I were going to attack a large ship that has turrets on it, we could boost the forward shield so that it can take a bit more punishment. Note that this does not affect the speed at which a shield regenerates. This means that boosting shield health will not magically make it recharge faster. All it does is move the health pool of the shields around to a facing that you want at any given time. That means it's best to use this tool as an anticipatory measure rather than a reactionary one, especially since moving the shield pools around causes a drain on the power systems since the facing getting the boost needs to regenerate this new health. So use this technique wisely. Now you'll notice that you can highlight and select each individual shield facing. Clicking a face will harden the shield, reducing the damage it takes and making it much more resilient to incoming fire. This damage reduction value is based on the shields that are installed, and some are better than others, but we'll talk about that in my components video coming down the line. Once a shield is hardened, it will count down with a white line until it depletes, after which it will enter a cooldown phase before it can be hardened again. During this time, other shields cannot be hardened until the countdown and cooldown phases are complete. This countdown and cooldown phase is affected by the type of shield installed. Some are faster than others at recharging, and others can hold the damage resistance for longer at the cost of higher recharge times. Unfortunately, shield hardening is something that is currently non-functional. We can activate the hardening, but the shield faces currently do not impart any actual damage reduction. It's speculated that this feature will get fleshed out when sign distance field tech upgrade for shields is brought in by CIG later down the line. So for now, this is just a placeholder until that feature is actually brought in. Next, we have the items tab at the top. This lists our current shield generators and their status indicators such as power draw, component health, component wear, and heat output. This page allows us to turn on and off individual generators if needed. All right, now let's have a look at the weapons page. On this page, we have three tabs, system, guns, and missiles. The systems page shows our currently installed weapons, as well as it gives us the ability to turn them on and off via the power toggle switches. To the right of the power switches, we have our weapon groupings. More on that in a moment. Next, we have our power throttle and readout indicator for each weapon. This functions similarly to the power throttle controls that we saw on shields and the power page. The difference is that this controls power output for our weapons. The number indicators on the right let us know how many weapons are assigned to its current group. On the bottom, we have our missile count and the ability to turn on and off the power to our missile pylons. On the guns tab, we can configure our installed gun systems. On the left, we can power on and off individual guns, and on the right, we can assign custom groups to each weapon installed. Weapons assigned to group 0 are fired by our primary fire button, default left mouse click. And weapons that are assigned to group 1 are fired by our secondary fire button, default right mouse click. This can be handy if you prefer to have all your guns fire at once with a single click of the fire button, or if you want to specifically space out your weapons between two separate fire groups. On the right of our groupings, we have the weapon name, and next over we have the type of damage the weapon does. Currently, these icons don't function properly. Normally, they're supposed to show if the weapons are ballistic, laser, distortion, etc., but instead they always show as ballistics in the current build. Next, we have ammo indicators. This will show how much ammo the weapon in question has. If the weapon is an energy-based weapon, then this indicator will be zero since, well, they rely on the ship's power rather than actual limited projectiles. Next, we have power draw, followed by the weapon's health status in percentage format. Next to that, we have the weapon's current wear, also in percentage format. 
and the weapon's current temperature, measured in kelvins. Try to keep the weapon's temperature below 700, otherwise the weapon will shut down to protect itself from heat damage. Finally, we have the Missiles tab. This shows our current complement of missiles on board our ship. On the left, we have the priority Q adjustment arrows, which allow us to assign which missiles get fired first. Unfortunately, this function doesn't currently work, although CIG has talked about updating this functionality in the future. Following that, we have the name of the missiles installed, followed by their size, tracking type, payload type, and the number of missiles currently available. All right, that's it for weapons. Now let's check out the heat page. This page shows our ship's current emission signal readout in real time, much like the one in the power page we saw earlier. On the top readout, we have the ship's current heat output. This is read from our ship's heat sinks. Ships generally run a cooling system that pumps fluid to cool down individual subsystems. If there are no coolers or the coolers are damaged or offline, then the heat gets offloaded to the ship's internal heat sink, causing these meters to rise as they read heat output data from the ship's heat sink. Currently, it's unclear what the bar under the heat output represents. I believe it may be a tolerance meter for the heat sinks, showing how much heat they can store before they need to be vented. But seeing as this is not entirely a fleshed out feature yet, and very little is known about the graphical detail that's shown here, it's difficult for me to provide concrete details as to what it actually does. For the time being, this really is only purely conjecture on my part, at least until CIG chimes in with more info about how this readout is intended to function. Below this, we have the electromagnetic emissions readout, which shows the current emissions given off by weapons and components that are active on the ship. The higher this value, the easier it is for EM or electromagnetic tracking missile weaponry to lock and track the ship. And further below, we have the infrared emissions readout. This differs from the heat output in that it shows the heat radiation given off by the ship, whereas the heat indicator shows the actual heat status of the internal heat sinks. The higher this value, the easier it is for IR or infrared tracking missile weaponry to lock and track the ship. Below the telemetry readouts, we have the general IR readouts of each category, such as weapons, shields, etc. This lets us know at a glance how much each subsystem is contributing to the overall IR signature of our ship. Furthermore, we have suppression toggles below each IR subsystem readout and an overall IR suppression toggle on the top right. These are supposed to suppress the IR signature of each category at will, lowering their IR signature and making the ship harder to detect and be locked onto. The way this works is that we can suppress our IR signals to keep permissions low. The trade-off is a lower signal at the cost of heat buildup, as the excess heat is offloaded to the internal heat sinks instead of risking a failure due to overheat. On the items tab above, we have a list of all available component items on our ship. Everything from weapons and thrusters to shields and quantum drive components and everything in between. Like the items tab on the power page, we can control power outputs to each individual component via the power throttle, as well as read the current power output and overclock those components. The key difference here is that we cannot rearrange the order of components listed like we could on the power page. However, what we get instead here is a more detailed output of our current components. We have the components current health status, wear status, and finally heat status. These three indicators are invaluable for letting us know at a glance the condition of our components on our ship. For example, if a component is damaged, the health value will reflect that and the component's functionality will be reduced as a result. You will most commonly see this reflected on external weapon hardpoints as they tend to take damage during combat and heavy engagements. The lower the component's health, the more the function and performance of the component begins to suffer. Wear is also important in that it's a separate value that keeps track of the performance and functionality of the component and is an indicator of how common misfires and other issues can occur for that component. For example, if a thruster accumulates a small amount of wear, it could potentially get stuck, misfire, or even have a surge of power, causing detrimental effects on our flight profile. Eventually, we'll have the ability for us to do our own maintenance on our ships to reduce wear. Until then, the only way to fix it really is just to repair at a station or spaceport. And last but certainly not least, we have the numerical temperature heat status indicator that shows us the current temperature of the component in question. Now, CIG has never implicitly stated what the unit of measurement this temperature readout goes by, but an educated guess would be that these temp readouts are in Kelvin. So a component with an idle status of 300 Kelvin would roughly be close to 27 degrees Celsius or just over 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Each component has a heat limit that when exceeded causes the component to shut down to protect itself from damage. For example, a thruster under afterburner will heat up rapidly until it reaches somewhere around the 7 to 800 range, after which it will shut down. 
This makes this page in particular handy if you like to keep constant watch of your thruster's heat output. Each component's heat limitation varies with the type of component, so it pays dividends to test the limits of thrusters and other components to know where you can push your ship to its limits and still be operational. The comms page is relatively straightforward. This page allows us to communicate with various entities around us, be they players, AI, or air traffic control towers. Most of the functionality for comms is limited. The only button to be aware of right now is the hail button, which will contact the ship or location in question. This is the most common way to contact a station or spaceport's air traffic control tower to request landing clearance. We also can hail other players, but currently it's not quite that functional, so in order to hail other players it's really relegated to using your Moby Glass instead. Next we have the self-target page. This page is like the readout we see on the top left of our screen that outlines the status of our ship's health when wearing a helmet. The main difference here is that we have a few more controls that we have access to to allow us to get better visuals of any damage to our ship. If you're not sure how to read the color status of your ship, be sure to refer to my previous basic combat tutorial video that talks about ship and ship health indicators. On the right of the status indicators are view toggle switches that rotate the view on several axes. This can be useful if you're not quite sure what may be damaged on your ship. You can rotate your view to get a better look at the bottom and top sections to see what exactly is damaged. Last on this page to the right, we have shorthand EM and IR readout indicators. The target page works similar to the target panel that appears on the top right of our screen when wearing a helmet. The difference here is the same as self-target, in that we have access to view controls and EM and IR readouts. The main difference here is the ability to actually hail the target that you have selected. Most ships are equipped with an annunciator panel. This panel displays shorthand alerts directly in your line of sight, informing you of issues that may require your attention. Each panel is set up differently in its organization, but the alerts here are all the same across each ship. On the panel, we have the power heat warning. This will light yellow if the power plant begins to overheat. Power low is a simple indicator letting you know that power draw is exceeding the output of your power plant. This can lead to issues with shield generation and weapon fire rates among other issues. Weapon heat will light up yellow when weapons are approaching their heat limitations and will light up red if weapons shut down due to overheating. Thruster heat works the same way, as it will also light up yellow when thrusters are reaching their peak heat tolerance, after which they'll turn red when thrusters enter emergency shutdown. Shield down will light up when a shield facing has collapsed, so when this lights up it's best to check your shields page to see which shield facing is offline. Proximity alert lights up when the ship sensors detect an object in your current flight path and you're in danger of impacting them. Quantum failure lights up when your ship's quantum field is collapsing due to quantum interdiction or when you're trying to spool up your quantum drives while a quantum dampener is active nearby. Radar lock lights up when a ship is actively targeting you. Targeting a player can sometimes be construed as a hostile action. When you see this, it's possible someone is gunning for you. Missile warning lights up when a missile is being launched at you. And cooler failure lights up when your ship's cooling system fails, either due to damage to the cooling components or other means, such as distortion damage. Alright, last and certainly not least, let's talk about radar. There are a few types of radar displays. A PPI style two-dimensional radar display and a three-dimensional nav map radar display. The two-dimensional style radar display shows ships in your vicinity represented by colored circles. Green is friendly and red is hostile. The larger the circle is, the closer you are to your target. Targets that are closer to the center are in front of the ship, and targets that are in the periphery are either behind or off to the sides of the ship. The three-dimensional display shows objects and ships within a 10km radius around the ship, 5 kilometers in the upcoming 310 update. Ships appeared as colored triangles, green is friendly, and red is hostile. Triangles pointing downward are above your canopy. Triangles pointing upward are below your canopy. This radar also displays missiles as red plus symbols. You can attenuate the radar's display range via the zoom slider on the bottom of the display. The 3D radar display also doubles as a navigation tool as you can zoom out by clicking the nav map scale and select destinations exactly as you would from the Moby Glass navigation app. You can return the display back to radar mode by clicking radar scale. On turret positions on certain ships, there's actually a specific MFD page for those turrets, but currently this page is actually very bare bones and it really only reports the turret's current azimuth. It's possible that this is being expanded more in an upcoming update for turret gameplay, but we'll have to wait and see what that actually pans out to be. Lastly, there's also multi-crew stations. 
Unfortunately, right now, multi-crew station MFD panels are really in only a read-only state, meaning that you can see the inputs the pilot is introducing to the MFDs, but the person at that station has no actual control over that station or the MFD panel itself. This is expected to change in the near future, as CIG has stated plans to implement a permission system where the ship's owner can designate roles to certain players, giving them access to MFD controls for certain stations. I'll be covering these in new multi-crew functions when CIG implements them down the road. Until then, these multi-crew seats tend to just be glorified passenger seats for the time being. CIG has stated that they plan on redoing a lot of HUD elements from the ground up, and this most likely means that we'll be seeing a rework for MFDs expected in the future. This will be more of a rework and design using CIG's new building block UI system. But the overall functionality outlined here will most likely stay the same, with of course some functionality expected to be added as specific gameplay mechanics like, say, stealth or whatnot are fleshed out. Also, component physicalization is still in the works, meaning that it's still possible we may see additional expansions to MFD functionality when it comes to component control down the road, when CIG implements components that we can swap out in real time rather than via the Moby Glass. This concludes my in-depth look at multifunction displays. Hopefully you took away some good nuggets of info regarding the MFD displays and how you can use them to understand the functionality and performance of our ships both in and out of combat in real time. All right, folks, that's it for me today. Thank you so much for hanging out with me and learning a little bit about MFDs. Hopefully you came away with something new that you picked up out of this. Uh, one of the things I'm super excited for right now is 310. As of publishing this, it's not out yet, but there's some really cool stuff in the pipe, including new turret gameplay, new targeting methodology, and new HUD elements that I will be going over. I do want to share with you all uh, how to best approach and understand this new system because there's a lot changing, including the flight model and stuff like that. So if you did feel like you came away learning something new out of this and you do enjoy and you want to support Star Citizen creators like myself, please, please feel free to drop a like. And of course, if you want to see more content, I don't post regularly. I work in the game industry, so I don't have the opportunity to post like every day or every week, whatever. Um, so if you do want to stay informed, please go ahead and subscribe. And of course, click the bell icon. It's more useful for a channel like myself where I don't post a whole lot regularly. So you'll get a notification and whatnot. Also, if you have comments, questions, concerns, or just want to know the meaning of the universe, whatever it is, please feel free to comment down below. I do read all the comments and I do like to look at them and engage in conversations and stuff like that. I love to uh, talk with folks out there. All right, folks, that's it for me. I hope you enjoyed this. I will be seeing you all in the comment section as well as I'll be seeing you in the next video. And of course, I'll be seeing you all in the black. <laughs>